I have never had to start off a video with a disclaimer before, but here it goes. Given Google's PR mishap with the Pixel 9 series, you might believe that some videos are dishonest. And while I can't speak for everyone, in this case, I paid for the Pixel 9 Pro XL with my own money, and I've never had any communication with Google, nor have I ever been a part of Team Pixel. So this is my honest review of the Pixel 9 Pro XL after two weeks of daily driving this device, and I can tell you for a fact that this is the best phone that I've used in a very long time. From the image and video quality down to the software and performance, even the design changes, I think Google absolutely nailed this phone. Now, I like to be a little bit more honest and critical in the videos that I make and pinpoint reasons why a device might not exactly be for you. But to be truthfully honest, with the Pixel 9 Pro XL, there is very little to complain about. And even if you're an iPhone user, I feel like the Pixel 9 Pro XL might be the better stepping stone for you into the Android ecosystem than something like a Samsung. So to find out why, before we get started, a like and a sub to the channel is always appreciated. We're almost at 40,000 subscribers, and I just wanna say thank you so much for the support that you've shown me on this channel. It really does mean a lot. And if we can hit 40K by the end of the year, I would really appreciate it. Anyways, I want to go over some specs quickly before diving into my experience with this phone because there's some impressive improvements and changes to this device over the Pixel 8 Pro. There's a slightly, and I mean slightly larger 5060 milliamp hour battery with support for 37 watts through a cable and 23 watts wireless. There is now also 16 gigs of RAM, which is good considering how much on-device AI stuff there is with the Pixel. Every single camera is now high in megapixels with a 50 megapixel main shooter, a 48 megapixel ultra wide, and a 48 megapixel five times telephoto, as well as a 42 megapixel front facing camera with phase detect autofocus. It also now has a much brighter gorgeous 3000 nit display, slightly larger as well at 6.8 inches, and the Pixel 9 Pro XL is using the new Tensor G4. Now, I was disappointed a little bit with the lack of UFS 4.0 storage because it would have improved the battery life and efficiency of the Pixel, but we will be diving into battery life shortly. Surprisingly, this phone also does state support for Wi-Fi 7, but it doesn't support the 320 megahertz channel widths, which are a part of the Wi-Fi 7 standard. That's the same issue the Pixel 8 Pro had as well, which is unfortunate, but to be honest, I don't think there's really that many people that could actually take advantage of Wi-Fi 7, so it's not a huge deal. Now, at a glance, the phone is completely different, right? I thought I disliked the new design language Google's opted for on the ninth generation Pixel series, but once you actually see it in person, I think you'd really grow to like it. iPhone inspired, maybe? But one thing that I can say about the Pixel 9 Pro XL's looks and feels is that although it's falling victim to the flat sides, Google's done it nicely. This phone in the hand is the most comfortable smartphone I've used in recent years. The edges have almost this pillow-like feel, making handling the phone without a case very nice. And regardless of what side you're on, matte versus gloss, the side rails on this phone being made from a shiny aluminum do wonders to help it keep from sliding out of your hands, giving you that extra grip. Now, I also expected serious patina with oils for my fingers and for it to get absolutely covered in fingerprints, but I was wrong and it actually withstands a lot, except for drops. I don't know if I just have horrible luck with pixels or the durability of these devices is pretty subpar, but whilst waiting for my speaking cases to come in the mail, I used one of Google's partner cases, which I will no longer be using anymore. I dropped this phone face down and surprisingly took a chunk out of the aluminum side rails, despite it being inside of the case. Thankfully, my Spigen cases came the next day, so I don't have to worry about this anymore, but it is really infuriating. This happened with my Pixel 7 Pro with the Google official case, and I've also dented the Pixel 8 Pro. And I'm someone who's extremely careful with my devices, so I don't really understand how that happened. Aside from that and my luck, I have to say that Google was on point with the aesthetics. This is the cleanest, most comfortable smartphone that I've even seen in a handful of years. And while we're just talking about some things that are new, a point of contention for a lot of people recently with the Pixel series as well has been the horrible fingerprint readers. And thankfully now, Google is using an ultrasonic fingerprint reader in the Pixel 9 series, and it's fast. It's also been two weeks now, and I can't recall a single time this has ever choked up on me, so that is exciting. And I won't lie, I still do prefer Face ID on the iPhone over a fingerprint reader, 
but with how fast and frictionless this has actually been, it's honestly perfect. And the fact there is still pretty snappy face unlock on the Pixel makes it a non-issue for me anyways, so that's good. Now, when you actually get into the device, you're greeted with a huge 6.8 inch OLED 120 hertz LTPO display with support for HDR10. Like I said earlier, it's bright at 3000 nits and with a 486 PPI, this display is absolutely top tier when it comes to flagships. It's nice to see Google being able to play with the big dogs and also not feeling left out when going with a Pixel. For videos, it's great and about as good as any OLED's gonna get. There's great colors, stunning contrast, and because the phone's a touch wider, I feel as though for 16x9 content, it really does shine on this device, giving you a large viewing area. For gaming, it's also perfect with good touch responsiveness and that high refresh rate in games that support it. Though, there's no doubt Google has a solid display on their hands with the Pixel 9 Pro XL. I will say I've actually been really enjoying editing the raw photos that I'm taking on this device using Lightroom and it handles it quite well. Tie that in with that really nice display, it's just been a really good canvas for me to actually work on. However, one area I would have liked to see improved with the display though is stealing a page out of Samsung's playbook with the anti-reflective coating to improve visibility outdoors. While the phone does get super bright and it can punch through a lot of the lights and reflections you see outdoors, there is absolutely no denying that Samsung's anti-reflective coating nailed it and it's kind of making every other alternative look kind of cheap in comparison. All right, now let's just talk about the Tensor G4 quickly. On paper, I was kind of worried about this SoC. I'm not gonna lie. It's close to iPhone 12 levels in performance in synthetic benchmarks and really seems to fall behind in areas like the GPU performance, especially when you compare it to something like the S24 Ultra. Except I was actually impressed by the performance I was getting out of this thing. The phone is super snappy, super responsive, app launch time, multitasking. I haven't really felt this phone hiccup. And in apps like Lightroom, when making an export with a bunch of raw photos, I did feel it to be fast. This is a flagship SoC, whether you like it or not. As for gaming, sure, the Pixel's not gonna be the most impressive smartphone. It does fall short from the A17 Pro and the 8 Gen 3, but you're really only going to notice these things when playing with either high fidelity titles or competitive shooters like Warzone Mobile if you want the most performance you can squeeze out of your device. In terms of casual gaming, even in those titles though, the phone is fine. I'll admit though, mobile gaming isn't really a big necessity for me anymore. So it's not something that I'm really interested in and it's not gonna affect my smartphone purchase that much and it hasn't really done so in recent years. But it is still nice to know that you can with the Pixel. And honestly, I would have no issues using this device for that. So it's a good sign. Now, of course, the G4 is more so focused on AI and efficiency. And in both cases, I can tell you that it actually does really well. Battery life on the Pixel 9 Pro XL is outstanding. This is the longest battery life that I've ever seen on a smartphone. I'm talking an easy nine to 10 hours of screen on time. This obviously depends on what you're doing on your phone. Using cellular data will definitely use more battery. Playing games and doing more intensive tasks will also drain it more. But I work from home and I use my phone mostly for Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, and I'm mostly connected to Wi-Fi for the most part. However, it is seriously outpacing the handful of phones that I've had in my position lately, and at least in my use case, I'm very impressed. I was also seriously impressed that Google solved one of the biggest issues with the Pixels, the overheating. And thanks to the new vapor chamber, the Pixel 9 Pro XL actually stays relatively cool through most tasks, and I've only really ever felt it get warm. And that's while charging. Now compare that to something like the 15 Pro Max, where I've had crazy overheating issues it's a pretty impressive change up and it's nice to see Google actually improve something that is fundamental to the use case of this device. In this case, the battery and the thermals are directly impacted by the slower Tensor G4. So I have to ask you, is gaming performance more important or would you rather have a phone that's more efficient and a lot cooler than something else that's on the market? For me, I'd rather take the phone that's gonna last longer and get me through the day. Quickly, before we get into some other lengthy topics, the speakers this year are actually pretty good. They're nothing crazy. They're not really gonna compare to the iPhone 15 Pro Max, but they're about on par with something like the S24 Ultra. The cellular reception and the Wi-Fi networking is also pretty decent. 
Uh, I don't have an issue in my basement apartment. It sounds pretty good. The calls are stable. And in terms of the actual network connectivity and performance, it seems to be working fine. So I haven't experienced any hiccups at all. And that is something that is a big improvement over the other Pixel devices because call dropping issues were actually a thing and it isn't anymore. Okay, so now this is kind of what I've been dreading talking about a little bit, and that's the AI. The Pixel is no doubt an AI phone. Features like Circle to Search, Magic Editor, Add Me, they all seem to be pretty highly advertised. And while I'm not necessarily the demographic for some of these, I can understand how they would be useful. With Add Me, you can quite literally add yourself or someone else into a group photo if you don't have someone else to take the picture. It kind of superimposes the extra person into a photo you've already taken, but it does it pretty well. Magic Editor can also be used in many ways, like with Magic Eraser to remove objects from the background or foreground to clean up your image. You can move or resize things with an image, change the color of the sky, and completely reimagine the photo that you've taken. Now, I like the authenticity of actually taking a photo and having that as a memory and something to look back on. But there's no doubt that these features are definitely really interesting to play with, and something like Add Me it could actually be beneficial. I would much rather ask someone else to take the photo, but honestly, not everyone these days can be pretty trustworthy. So to hand over an 1800 Canadian dollar phone and just expect them to help you out, I, I would rather not, to be honest. Gemini has now also made its way to the Pixel, both by replacing Google Assistant and now has the ability to message Gemini on Google Messages. I actually really like Gemini, and this switch has actually made me use Gemini a lot more than Google Assistant, which is something that I can appreciate. It learns you, what's near you, and some of your interests, and it can give you personal results and suggestions. Instead of just asking for food near me, you can say things like, give me some burger places to eat that I can also get beer on tap, or, give me some fun ideas for a date in my area that don't cost a lot of money and are exciting. It is actually such a helpful tool, and while I haven't dived too much into it with all of its capabilities, it still does surprise me on a daily basis. I will definitely be doing a follow-up video on Gemini, and whether that's on the Pixel or on the S24 Ultra, it is something that I do want to cover. There's just a lot of features that are included with it, and I think that it is a really useful tool. One thing that I really like about Gemini, though, is its ability to summarize phone calls and text messages. I find it incredibly useful. And now, new to the Google Pixel, not that this is an AI thing, but there's a new screenshots app rather than filling up your Google Photos, which I think is perfect. I've definitely found it to be useful and it does help that it doesn't clutter your Google Photos and immediately back those up automatically. So that is something nice that I really appreciate. It's just one way to help me stay organized on this device. But yeah, like, I don't know. I feel like I could sit here all day and talk about the AI stuff. And I feel like a lot of you are probably sick of hearing about these AI features. So I am gonna move on, but that is one thing that the Pixel is really well known for and there's a ton of features on here that make the device a lot more natural to use and a lot more personal to you. And I think as a smartphone and as like a daily companion, it is definitely beneficial. And I can honestly see this being a reason as to why someone actually buys this device specifically. But quickly though, I do want to talk about the speed of Magic Editor. I feel like for something that is supposed to be selling devices with this on-device editing program, it's very slow. Uh, a lot of the stuff that is done on device can take quite a while and there are quite a few hiccups when actually using it. I know that we're still in the early stages of Magic Editor, but it would be nice to see that quickly improve. And it is also a shame that the Pixel didn't launch with Android 15 and launches with Android 14, despite this supposedly being, you know, the peak Android device, something that Google is basically using as a way to get people's eyes on Android. Okay, that was a mouthful, so let's move on. <laughs> Probably the best thing about the Pixel, at least hardware-wise, are the cameras. Three brilliant sensors tucked away inside of a singular oval piece of glass. And these cameras are fantastic. Whether you're using the 50 megapixel main sensor, the ultra wide or the telephoto, every single photo is sharp, has a nice pop of color from the Pixel's processing, and is very shareable right out of the camera. The images are vibrant, yet feel so real and lifelike. There's so much personality to these images that the Pixel takes, whereas the iPhone seems to be much more neutral and muted. The Pixel just likes to liven things up, and from a point-and-shoot perspective, 
I like that a lot more. Honestly, I found it very hard to take a bad image with the Pixel. Even photos just documenting my day. They're nice, they're punchy, and they stand out. And the raw images, they have a ton of flexibility. Although while I do like shooting in raw on the pixels, I do have to say that the actual shutter speed when shooting raw is quite slow. So it does kind of kill the experience a tad, but the payoff is definitely worth it. And I've always said that I liked the Pixel 8 Pro's cameras and talked about how sad I was to switch off of that phone just because of those cameras but it's true and now having much more powerful sensors with Google's color science, I really don't wanna go back to what I was using. I actually find myself taking the Pixel out of my pocket a lot just to go ahead and shoot things and post them on my Twitter, which by the way is at Valley's Mind if you do wanna follow it. But it's made the actual capturing process much more enjoyable and I like the images that I'm getting out of this thing. Low light is good. Dynamic range is impressive and there isn't really anything for me to complain about. I guess it just comes down to preference or whether or not you like the more exaggerated color. Even the 42 megapixel selfie camera is impressive and there's no need to even turn the camera around to try to get a blind photo with the better sensors. And for video, I was thoroughly impressed with the performance of the Pixel 9 Pro XL shooting in 4K using the main sensor. It looks fantastic. I wouldn't say that this is the best out there when it comes to video performance, and there's definitely some things that this phone can do that are a little less desirable, like the stabilization and the camera's performance when changing lenses. That being said, at least in terms of the image quality, I think that anyone picking up this phone would be very happy with the results. There's also Video Boost, which I found does a lot of pretty cool tricks to alleviate some of those harsher stabilization and the jitter in the lens switching. And it really does amp up the quality, especially in night scenes. And although Video Boost is not an on-device feature, it is something that's done over the cloud and does take some time to be processed, the end result is much more improved over the native recording of the Pixel. To be honest though, I don't actually know if I could really ever justify actually using Video Boost just for the sake of, it's kind of a pain. I mean, it doesn't add a ton to the video that someone is going to notice at a glance. So if you're kind of just shooting things in your day to day that you want to show people, it's not really worth using Video Boost for because that processing time could take quite a while. It is cool to have, and I like Google doing these things, but again, it's, it, it's whatever, man. And so this is what 4K 30 recording looks like on the Pixel 9 Pro XL. And it does prioritize the lighting on your face so that it can get everything, you know, with nice dynamic range and whatever, which sometimes I think could look a little unnatural. But what it does is make sure that you're always in the shot. You're always exposed properly. And honestly, sometimes for like a quick little front facing video, that's all that really matters. So I don't have much to complain about. I actually think the selfie camera looks pretty dang good for video. Now, I think that the coverage of the Pixel 9 Pro XL is gonna focus mainly on the software experience. And don't get me wrong, it's amazing, it's a Pixel. Google's done wonders with their launcher, the fluidity, the customization, the AI, but I think that this is finally Google's year for a more high-end hardware-focused device. And my time that I've spent with the Pixel 9 Pro has actually been great. And Honestly, I find it very hard to even want to test the upcoming iPhone because I'm just so content with this device. But that's been it. If you've enjoyed this video, go ahead and leave a like down below for me. Leave a comment if you have any questions or wanna see any other kinds of videos about the Pixel. And yeah, if you've watched all the way to the end, go ahead and throw down a camera emoji just so I know who the real ones are. And I'll see you all in the next one. Peace out.